Okay. Um, CS for HS is a program that provides funding to nonprofits and colleges and universities to provide high quality professional development for computer science teachers to help improve learning and teaching. Today I'm really pleased to have as our guest Owen Astakan. Owen is the Director of Undergraduate Studies in Computer Science and the Professor of Practice at Duke University where he's taught for a very long time. Uh, in addition to that, he builds curricula approaches and works on teaching intended for a broad adoption and adaptation. And we are going to be talking today about a particular program that is very near and dear to both our hearts, the new Computer Science Principles course. Um, if you don't know about this course, uh, it is going to make a major contribution and a major change to computer science education in the United States and create opportunities to engage more broadly the student population in our very beloved discipline. So Owen, welcome. Thanks Chris. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and, and thanks to Google for all the hard work it and you do for both computer science principles and computer science education everywhere. Thank you so much. Back at you. So, Let's talk about the Computer Science Principles course. Um, what is it? What's happening with it nationwide? Um, and what do you see as critical, interesting milestones that are coming up? So I'll give you a, a very quick overview. And if people have questions, they can, I think, have a, a mechanism for asking for more details. Uh, Computer Science Principles is a, is a new AP course first initially funded by the National Science Foundation and now co-funded by the NSF and College Board. And it's designed to be an advanced placement course that's broadly appealing. So that means appealing to women, underrepresented groups, and, and in fact, everybody who can take an AP course and is interested, and we hope we'll, there will be more people interested in computer science. It was first envisioned in about 2008. Uh, Chris was one of the people that were involved in the a small group that were involved in the formation of it, and then a larger and larger group started making, giving advice and helping it grow. And it's been designed right from the beginning to be a course different than the current AP course, which is a great programming course, but it's, it's programming. And the, our disciplines had a hard time making sure that our courses are taken by women especially, and then the underrepresented groups as well. So this course was designed kind of with some best practices in mind that would make it broadly appealing. And I'll say some more about that later in this hangout. But it, it will be an AP course, first, and it first launched with an exam in 2016-2017. So that academic school year of 2016-2017, we'll see this be an AP course. It's been piloted in more than 100 schools already both as part of the formal College Board NSF project and then some affiliated projects that I'll say more about. It has an assessment that's different for AP assessment. It actually requires collaboration with someone as part of the formal assessment for which you will be graded, get a score of one through five on an AP test. So that's new and one of the th reasons that we think this will be appealing. And it's also about more than just programming. Programming is one of the seven big ideas of computer science. And we think that making it a part of that part of computer science, but not the whole thing, is one of the reasons that this course will be broadly appealing. Oh, and one of the things that's been really interesting to me watching as this, this process rolls out is how supportive the entire computer science community has been. Um, we have a bit of a tendency to kind of circle the wagons and fire inward, as, as Jan Cuny from NSF has said. This has been a very different experience with the development of this course. Can you, can you share a little bit of information about why you think that might be and how you've perceived the community and engagement and support for this course? I, I think that's absolutely right, and I think it's you know, either because we're maturing a little bit as a community and also because of the leadership of the group of people that Jan and the others that were involved initially brought in and designed this to be a community driven process. So though Chris and I were there at the first meeting when this course came up and there was a small group of 10, very quickly it became a group of 30 that were giving us advice and that group of 30 was broadly constituted to not just be college professors but to include high school teachers and groups from exploring computer science and related projects. So we did get advice and solicited feedback and, and took it from the whole community. And we went very early 
to high schools and colleges saying, do you think this is a good idea? And ask for their opinion and for their support to make sure that it w could be an AP course, meaning it would get credit or placement from colleges and universities. And we got that, which was, I think, a little surprising to everyone. But the conversation was not about how one size could fit all or trying to make one approach, but especially encouraging a variety of approaches to the framework that we envisioned. And I think encouraging that variety of approaches and getting getting that support from many different groups who have very different flavors for this course was kind of part of why it's been successful and people have been willing to support it in with different ways that realize the same goals. Yeah, can you've mentioned the you know that there is a framework for this course based on big ideas in computer science. Can you talk a little bit about what the curriculum framework is and and what underlies it in terms of learning objectives and exclusion statements? Sure. The uh, the framework which is now set and will be the framework that is used to launch the exam in 2016 has evolved over the last six years. Now it consists of a, kind of an interesting approach. First there are seven big ideas and you can find these big ideas on APC, APCSprinciples.org but there are seven big ideas and I'll, I'll mention them a little bit and there are six computational thinking practices so the idea is that you'll, you'll cross a big idea like programming or algorithms or data or the impact of computing or the internet so you'll take one of those big ideas and cross it with a thinking practice like collaborating or communicating or abstracting and taking a big idea and crossing it with a computational thinking practice will get you a learning objectives a learning objective so there are about 30 plus learning objectives and they're reasonably detailed I, I will I will read one as an example later and those learning objectives are each supported by evidence statements that get a little more concrete so you, each time you view the curriculum framework you'll go closer and closer into seeing uh, what the teachers and students are expected to do and then you mentioned the exclusion statements which are relatively new in the past six months but those also help teachers now and they will help students understand something about what's expected in the course so I'll give you a, a quick example of some of these big ideas computational thinking practices and, and how they work together so one of the learning objectives is that students will be able to and all the learning objectives are written in that form of what students should be able to do use computers to process information find patterns test hypotheses about digitally processed information to gain insight and knowledge and under the essential knowledge of what students need to know which is a little different than what students need to do you'll see things like patterns can emerge when data is transformed using computational tools and insight and knowledge can be obtained from translating and transforming digitally represented information so many of the, uh, of the essential knowledge pieces there are more than 300 of those there are a lot and the idea is that in a course teachers would be combining them these essential knowledge pieces in exercises assignments projects that students would do keeping in mind something like in case teachers are worried an exclusion statement is very brief here's one example that applies to those learning objectives from data data is the big idea that I just read some learning objectives from students are not expected to know specific formulas or options available in spreadsheets or data software packages so it's reasonably clear that students will be expected to use spreadsheets or some data access ways to be able to understand and filter and form insight and knowledge from data but the test itself wouldn't ask for specific formulas to be applied in answering questions to demonstrate an understanding of data and so the framework that consists of these seven big ideas six computational thinking practices 31 learning objectives and 300 evidence statements is, is used to to create very different but related courses that ultimately will prepare students for the AP exam. Great. While you've been while you've been creating this incredibly deep level of 
of, of curriculum for this course. Have you run into particular challenges or, or you know, contentious issues that you needed to, to work out as a group? Or, you know, this is an enormous undertaking. What have you found that's been, that's been most challenging but also potentially most rewarding? There are a couple of couple of ways of, of looking at that, and I'll try to get at all of them. But I'll, let me answer one of the questions you asked ask before, which I think helps explain a few things here that have not been contentious. Um, and that is, for the programming part of this uh, course, no language is specified, but rather features of what students do with a programming language. Those are what's specified. And most all programming languages share features like loops and if statements and functions or procedures. And because no language was specified and so many different languages have been used, I think we stayed out of the language wars that were have been there from the beginning in the regular AP course where when we went from Pascal to C++, a lot of people got angry. And now it's in Java and there's a cry from some people, could we please change it to Python? And in APCS principles, if you want to use Python, and people are, then you use Python. And if you want to use Scratch or Snap, then you use Scratch or Snap. And I think that the, that choice of making it language agnostic has been pretty instrumental in helping ensure that the community has embraced it. And so what has been an issue is trying to make sure that people understand what do we mean by analyzing data and what's big data. And so that's evolved because, for example, what's big data in a graduate program or when you read in the news about how banks are being hacked or how the Human Genome Project works, that's data on a, an enormous scale. And we're in this course, it's about understanding more data than you can look at on a piece of paper, but still not terabytes of data at one time. So I think those contentious issues have kind of been filtered and changed over time so that they're not really contentious anymore because as the course has been piloted, students and teachers have kind of come to the same page of, well, this is a course where we're trying to give students a flavor for a lot of different things. A rigorous flavor, but not the same depth that you would get in a pro course that was all programming or all cryptography or all data. So I think we've kept some of that contentious flavor out by making it designed to be a rigorous course, but not designed so that the people that really feel ownership of an issue will be upset because, well, you didn't do it my way. Um, and I think that's helped the community as a whole. So we've stayed away from most of the contentious parts, which is, I think, been a process that comes from the design of including everybody and part of the process of just making sure that we don't stick with one approach that we think fits all. So that's been good from the beginning. And, and I think it's really exciting, too, because you know, partially underlying this is the idea that, that teachers and educators should be able to pick the tools that they think are best for supporting the learning goals in their particular classrooms. And that's, that's really exciting. One of the things I've noticed is that, as you say, there have been some very diverse approaches that have been um, surfaced in the pilots. So could you talk a little bit about about you know, the piloting process and what's happening with that nationally? Sure. Uh, the, the original pilot, when we first started, and that's many years ago, was getting a few colleges and universities to try this out to make sure that it could be an AP course, since for an AP course, there has to be some contact with colleges and universities to get credit or placement. You can see more information about those early pilots online on the APCSPrinciples.org site. But now we are at a point where for the College Board NSF project that I'm part of, we have about 50 people piloting it, and this is the second year of that pilot. And what's interesting is each of those pilots are often part of another project, some facilitated by NSF, some done by uh, nonprofits like Project Lead the Way and at some point Code.org. But right now we have teachers that are part of which is using I mean, to get at all the concepts of CS principles. And another group that's using spreadsheets and Alice to get at these concepts in Southern California. 
So there are different groups that have embraced certain tools and platforms and sometimes embraced different approaches. There's a group in Texas, from the University of Texas, that has a project. And they don't really talk about the programming tools or platforms. They talk about how it's a digital world and being an effective digital citizen is kind of the foundation of what they're building. So each group has taken a different approach to saying, here's what our course is about. And teachers are using these different approaches, both as part of those real consortia and projects, and then as part of this broader project, too. And so we hear information that goes back and forth. And some teachers that are part of a project that's about Alice might say, wow, this is a great tool that these other guys are using. I can use that to get at these big ideas. So that's been another kind of welcoming part that these different projects do have some kind of cross-pollination in terms of good ideas. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the nitty-gritty of the course. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of our viewers are very interested in the 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 um, the performance tasks and you guys hear me? I heard Chris. You froze for a little bit there, and I think you asked about the performance tasks. I did. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening with the performance tasks? Okay, the performance tasks are a pretty exciting part of what is the formal assessment for the AP course. In most AP courses, the assessment is a three-hour kind of high-stakes exam that happens in May. And what the, the score on that exam is what determines whether you get credit or placement. And for many students and many other AP courses, preparing for that test is something that the last month or two months takes and requires. You want to make sure that students are ready to do well even though they spent most of the year perhaps doing projects and assignments that are part of the course but aren't directly related to the exam, which would be typically multiple choice and handwritten responses. That's the way it is in the programming computer science exam and in exams like English and history. What computer science principles is doing is taking uh, some cues from other AP courses, AP Studio Art, and there's a new AP uh, course that will come online that's related to kind of doing research that's not broadly out yet. But they have through course assessments in the AP Studio Art, students create either 2D or 3D designs over the course of the year according to some theme, and they turn those artworks in as part of their grade. For computer science principles, the performance tasks in some ways can be thought of as conceptualizing a portfolio of your work to turn that in and that will be what's graded and assessed rather than a free response question. Right now there are two portfolio tasks. At last year three were piloted and the current version there are two. One is called Create and it requires that you work with a partner to develop some programs that you create first together with your partner and then you work individually to create something that's related and it can use some of the same code or it can be completely independent. And you work with your partner to develop an explanation of what the program does and how you debugged it and what algorithms are in it. And so in addition to developing a program, you create a video of that program running and you write about the program and turn that in. That's the create performance task and it's interesting because the area of concentration, what you make that program about is completely up to the student. And that freedom and that kind of alignment with student interest is one of the things that's been shown to work kind of across gender and across uh, ethnic and racial profiles so that many students can find something that interests them and then write a program about it. The other performance task is about the impact of computer science and students have to do some research and then talk about how data and cybersecurity might be part of the impact that some innovation has and how that innovation might affect a significant population or have a big impact on a small population and, and discuss the trade-offs in how computing might be used to help different parts of our society. Sometimes those helpful things can have some effects that you might want to be careful about and 
understanding those dynamics is what that performance task is about. And those are the two tasks that are part of the current pilot, and we envision that those will be part of the final course as well. And that's an exciting difference in this AP course compared to other AP courses. Can you, can you talk yet about what the evaluation process will be for the performance tasks in terms of, of the grading towards the student's mark? Who does the evaluation? How is that going to be handled? Sure, I can, I can say some things that are in common to all APs and how they'll work a little with this AP. So for all AP courses, the, the free response, or in this case, the performance tasks, and in the case of Studio Art, the artworks, are evaluated by a group of teachers and instructors. So high school teachers and college teachers typically gather together in one place to go over that work and apply a rubric to ensure that the grading and evaluation is done consistently and reliably, and then the process of taking the marks that are given using that rubric and coming to a score of one through five is something that is done in consultation with psychometricians and statisticians that use the multiple choice questions combined with these uh, performance tasks. The, we ha there's a new rubric that's just been released that's kind of a draft rubric for how things are going to work. Uh, I can, I'll say a little bit about that. But, so that rubric is going to be tested by using our pilot instructors during both in December and in the spring to see how the rubric works. Then the rubric will be adjusted based on how well it can be applied and what the teacher feedback is. So that by the time the course is launched, there will be a rubric that teachers and students can see. So you will know how your performance task product the program you write or the answers to the questions in the video or computational artifact you create, you'll know how the, what the rubric is and whether you can kind of design your performance task to realize a high score will be kind of up to you. There will be no hidden secrets of, well, you forgot to do this since the rubric will be something that students see. Uh, the, the rubric I'll give you a very high level view, and if you'd like some more, I'll, I'll be able to go more deeply into it. The new rubric is nice because it only has a scale of kind of one, two, or three that you can apply across several criteria. The previous rubrics have had more points, like maybe up to ten, and sometimes it's hard to know what's the difference between a six, a seven, an eight, a nine. It's a much easier to apply a three-point scale. And this is the same scale that's been used in some other AP programs. So the test assessment experts from College Board have some experience with it. And I'll, I'll read you just a small sample for some of the things that, that are part of the programming rubric to give you an idea of how it might work. And this is, to be, make sure that everybody understands, this is still a draft. So it hasn't yet been applied to student artifacts, and when it is, some adjustments are going to be made. So the performance quality on the collaborative program, so this is the program that students develop with a partner. The scale of one to three says, for a one, there's a simple program that demonstrates limited use of programming elements. For two, an understandable program that demonstrates competent use of programming elements. And for three, a complex program that demonstrates strategic and creative use of programming elements. Now, I think there's some terminology in there that will evolve over time. And when we see example student work with the rubric applied to it, which College Board will provide, teachers and students will have a much better idea on how these three-point rubrics apply. And there are 10 to 20 different areas that have a scale of one to three, and the final score will be accumulated across all of those and then points will be awarded. I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see, and teachers will be able to apply the rubric themselves, and then get feedback from what other teachers do to find out if they're on the same page and how that will evolve over time. One of the things that's really exciting about, about the performance task um, from a, kind of an external and also industry perspective is it seems that not only are you hitting on the doing element of computer science, you know, beyond the knowing element, the actual doing element, but it's really been carefully constructed in a way that's very 
um, it's very similar to how we want students to understand the issues and the, the joys of working in an almost real environment. And what I mean by that is engaging with real problems, real things that interest them, but also working collaboratively in, collaboratively in a team, documenting what you're doing, presenting your project, and then also you know, looking at the world around you in terms of this incredible technology that we're using and, and look at, trying to, to look at it from, from an objective perspective about pros and cons. Was it, you know, was that kind of thinking really part of the, the zeitgeist of building this amazing new course? Or did it just kind of evolve because of the, the larger engagement of the community in its, in its development? I think I think first that you're absolutely right that all those characteristics that you mentioned are one of the reasons that the course has a lot of potential and it's getting so much kind of support even two years before it's going to be offered people are wanting to start teaching it and I think it, it has been part of what we've been doing from the beginning because we listen to people from so many different areas and when you listen to all those voices, and, and this is another reason that we need a diverse set of voices, you get different perspectives and then trying to merge those perspectives together towards this common goal of student engagement, I think has led here. So I think the diversity of opinions that was solicited and the broad engagement is the process was designed to lead to a place like this. And the fact that these current performance tasks exhibit the characteristics that you just mentioned, which are things that we're not just seeing in industry, but we're seeing asked for now in schools as well, so that even in the common core, students are expected to collaborate and work together sometimes. So those things that are part of our workforce and our society are things that are coming down into education. And I, again, I'm coming back to listening to a different group of people rather than academic experts who are confident that their approach is best has, has been a, a good part of the design process and people have been willing to think well maybe there are some other points of view and I think that's been an important part of the success. You mentioned earlier that um, that you're that the, you're, you're now undergoing the work uh, of um, creating and and testing the uh, the, the formal assessment piece of the assessment process. Um, I know specific assessment questions, but but how is that going, and and what's kind of the process for creating the the written assessment piece? Uh, that's that's a th those are that's a great question. Um, the actual development of the test is done by a test development committee. All AP tests that are cr that are overseen by the College Board have an AP development committee that consists of about eight people equally distributed among high school and college folks and that's the group that's essentially empowered with creating the exam and the formal course description so they're the group that has taken the framework that you and I were initially part of and then tuned it to being something that can be used by the psychometric experts and the statisticians so the current test that's being envisioned has just recently announced that it's going to be a paper and pencil test which is I think a little unfortunate in some ways but completely understandable and I'll say why. Uh, when it was first envisioned the idea was that maybe this would be a computer-based assessment which would allow you to have something beyond multiple choice questions. It might have software that students could run and adjust parameters of to make a simulation and answer questions about it as part of the objectively scored part. But I think for good solid reasons in terms of making sure that all communities could be reached and that there were no issues in terms of are you connected to the internet? Do you have enough computers for everybody in your school to take a test at the same time? Um, those issues I think could change in, in the near future because of a lot of work that's being done on assessment outside of AP where for many states the common core related exams are going to require computers that can be used at scale to take tests but right now we're not quite there so I think in the first year of the course to ensure that 
as many people can be reached in the first year, having a, an assessment that's paper and pencil at the beginning makes a lot of sense in terms of reaching all communities, all schools, and not having access to computers for a particular time. That's the other thing for AP. The exams are offered on something like May 3rd at 12 o'clock, and there's no room for changing that the way AP is offered. So I think it makes a lot of sense that this is a paper and pencil test for the first few years of the course. And then College Board has indicated that as, as things evolve, both with computer access and other resources available, maybe it could change to being an exam where other forms of questions could be done because the multiple choice questions are being designed right now. There, there will be a sample test released by the end of this academic year so that people can see a smattering of the kinds of questions that will be asked. Um, and, and that's a resource that teachers have been clamoring for and College Board is working on that now with the, the Test Development Committee. So um, I think that's a the really interesting point and, and a fairly new development in the, in the, 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 the progress of the course and, and in a lot of ways eminently reasonable. Um, I think for, for many there's an assumption that all schools are wired with you know, broadband access and the reality is that you know, often maybe the school secretary has a, has a network connection on her desk but that's about it as far as it goes and when you look at the school challenge of scheduling multiple AP exams in, in, in a rigid timeline, um, it begins to look like there would be a lot of people who would not be getting on this bus simply because they didn't have any wheels. And, and I think that that's, you know, it, it may be a, a, a bit of a controversial um, decision, but I, but I think, you know, just given that this is a course that's created to give all students a chance for an engagement, we don't want to create technical issues that are going to, you know, become a roadblock for them participating. So, you know, it, it may be a surprise to folks that this is going to be how it unfolds in the first few years, but, but given the realities of classrooms and the availability of the technologies, it makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, one of the things you touched on just now was on, you know, the issue of resources. New course rolling out, lots of teachers, you know, wanting to get up to speed. What do you see in terms of um, critical resources that are going to be rolled out that will help help teachers get up to speed and prepared to teach and to incorporate and teach this new course? That's, that's a question that we often hear and so <laughs> I'm happy to try to offer some some perspectives there. So some of the NSF projects have had workshops that teachers can participate in from any area of the country. So the, the Beauty and Joy of Computing project which is kind of duly headquartered in NC State and at University of California Berkeley, they've offered a series of summer workshops and professional development experiences for teachers. They hope to be able to continue to do that. And that gets teachers kind of a face-to-face -face professional development as well as a blended online component afterward. We have pointers to these on the Computer Science Principles website. Other NSF projects are more regional but still offer kind of large-scale professional development in Massachusetts and Connecticut, the mobile group that's using App Inventor and Android development has professional development. Google through CS4HS has sponsored two MOOCs that happened this past summer and those materials will be continue to be available online. One of those is done in the CS for Alabama group and the other one is the mobile group I just mentioned with App Inventor. And those are online professional development experiences which are better than nothing and, and incredibly good. Many teachers thrive in a face-to-face -face environment because you know you're going to succeed in the small number of days that are there and it's easy to kind of lose track in the MOOC. But the MOOCs are a great resource if you get started because then you get your own pace and not everybody can take five days away from their life to, to go off and do a face-to-face -face experience. Uh, a PD experience. Those, so those MOOCs will continue and I imagine that other ones may roll out. The Project Lead the Way, which is a nonprofit, has a long professional development, but th that's an, an area where a school has to sign up or a district. So if those schools or districts signs up, sign up, 
they get to send their teachers to their two-week professional development. Right now, Project Lead the Way probably has more CS Principles pilot courses going this year, about 200 plus, than any other single group. But it is harder to get into because you can't be an individual teacher and decide to do that. Similarly, Code.org is going to have Computer Science Principles projects next year with some of their partner districts. And their material will all be accessible online. Their professional development materials will be online. But their professional development is designed to be used by their partner districts. I ex and then next, starting next year, we will see College Board. Every, when, there are AP, when a course becomes an AP course, the College Board starts holding AP Summer Institutes and College Board workshops for teachers that are interested. Those will happen just before the exam launches in the summer of 2016. But we'll see resources coming online in 2015, including online curriculum modules that teachers can use to support their courses, and then other materials online. For College Board, when there's an AP course, the teachers go through a, an audit process for their course to kind of be approved. And that will happen starting partway through the 2015-2016 school year. And then I think we'll see a lot of professional development possibilities coming online the year before. But even this coming summer, we're going to see a lot of, from the NSF point of view. And I hope that teachers will think about going to conferences like the CSTA conference. Uh, Chris, you probably know a little bit about that. A little there bit. Were, <laughs> there, there were many workshops and sessions last, last year that were part of about computer science principles. There was even a special extra day conference devoted to computer science principles. And I know many groups are working to try to get some workshops and sessions into the CSTA thing, uh, conference. And there's some, there'll be some in conjunction with and prior to workshops as well that I can talk about the ones I know about, and I'm sure there might be ones I don't know about. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that one of the things that's really exciting about this, this entire undertaking is that the community as a whole um, is very engaged in everything that's going on. And you know, I've, I was, long before I joined Google, which was fairly recently, I was a big fan of CS for HS. And one of the, the real goals of CS for HS is to really watch the professional development environment for computer science and to, to contribute in ways that Google can exercise its strengths, sometimes move the needle forward, sometimes do things that you know, other groups may not be doing or contribute to a larger, a larger community effort. And while I can't say too much about it yet, you know, we are definitely looking at this space as a really important space for all of computer science education. And you'll see some, some really interesting, I think, announcements coming out from CS for HS with the uh, applications to open in, in December. So, so we are part of this community that is really looking at the professional development issue and making a, contribu a contribution as we can. Um, one of the questions that, and this is a bit of a you know, sideways question for you, but I keep hearing it at, at events, is what about other kinds of more physical resources, textbooks, curriculum guidelines? Do you, are you hearing conversations in the community about that and those kind of resources being developed? Uh, that, that's an interesting question for several reasons. Uh, the traditional AP courses have asked for a textbook to be used in conjunction with the course as part of the audit process. But I think there's actually some recognition by the College Board that for this course, it may be that a textbook isn't, a single textbook is not the best approach. So I know there are some groups that are developing textbooks for teachers, for example. And there are some people that are developing books for a part of the course. So there are some open, not, well, technically not open source, but Creative Commons license materials, such as the Blown to Bits book that was put out by a group be between MIT and Harvard. And I know of at least one group that's working on a new version of Blown to Bits, because that I'm involved with that group, uh, because that, it's about seven years old. And the idea is that maybe it should be brought up to speed. And so I think you're, we're going to see some materials available online for, or for use offline, they're not going to be just online materials, that are different than traditional textbooks. And I think that 
those resources are going to be things that College Board will say, you know, these are good resources for courses to use. And as part of these curricula that we talked about, you will see kind of full-blown, here's how you can conduct your whole class. That's more of a curriculum than a textbook, but those are kind of related resources. So I want to uh, take a moment to, you know, recognize the participation of all our folks out there who are um, joining us virtually. And I actually have a question for you, Owen, coming out from our, uh, our participants. Uh, the question is from Chris Mayfield. Hi, Chris. Um, he says, you mentioned going to universities early on to get feedback and support for CSP to become a new AP course. Now that things are fleshed out, curriculum framework, performance task rubrics, will there be a need to repeat this attestation process? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so I have a two-pronged answer to that. As I understand it, um, there's no plan to repeat the attestation process. That's not a process that's part of the formal college board kind of reevaluation of their existing AP courses. So college board does reevaluate existing AP courses to see if they should be modernized or changed. But that process doesn't typically include going to colleges and universities to see, is the course still right and in a formal process-oriented way. However, there is a plan to kind of rethink the, we had a meeting many years ago of many college chairs or directors of undergraduate programs to kind of get them all together before CS principles started to see, should there be a computer science principles course? And if there was, would it replace or be in addition to the existing kind of introduction to computer science courses? And I think there, we will see another kind of convening of a group of educators to make sure that this program is on track and that that group will include some of the folks from the initial uh, advisory board and some people from the community as well. And that will inform this process going forward. So that's not the formal attestation, but I think it will be a, a, a meeting and a process designed to ensure that the current version of the course is something that many colleges and universities will continue to give credit or placement to. So it will be not a formal attestation, but I think it will serve in the place of what that was designed to do. So, so one other um, area that's kind of interesting to explore is when this course is launched in the 2000 school year, the goal, the hope, the dream is really to have wide-scale adoption of this course. I mean, Jan Cuny from the National Science Foundation set us the dream of having this computer science course available in you know, 10,000 schools. Um, when, we, when we met, you and I, this summer at the CSTA uh, Google Summit on the Computer Science Principles course, one of our goals was really to talk to administrators about the importance of making this course available in their schools. Um, how, how important is the, the participation of school principals and school administrators in, the, in this effort to really make this course broadly available to all students? I think the support from uh, principals and administrators is going to be key and kind of essential to helping this go. The principals and administrators are the group that can kind of help get a new course into what's being offered. They can help champion what teachers are asking for. and so. Ensuring that principals and then administrators at both the local, regional, state level are aware of the options because computer science principles is, is a course that uh, we've been working on for a long time, but not every school may be ready to do an AP course and then knowing about other national efforts like exploring computer science could be helpful. Um, but having principals and administrators know about CS principles and the other options I think it's a, it's a very important task. I know that both College Board and the CS Principles Project and, and then other groups like Google and CWIT are working on ensuring that there are kind of ways of getting administrators to be aware of both the need for these courses that, you know, computer science principles has not done well in attracting women in underrepresented groups and then knowing what options are available both at the kind of class and then school and then district and state level. So 
facilitated by different groups like the CSTA that's working at this level, uh, now kind of supported in some sense by Code.org, who also has a branch that's doing advocacy. The CSTA, Code.org, and Computing in the Core group that's been working on not just what's going on at the state, but what's going on at the local and regional level. I think those are going to be key pieces to ensuring the broad and widespread adoption of, of, of these projects. On, on a slightly separate but related um, topic, one of the questions that um, we are seeing come up also is, what is the relationship between the Computer Science Principles course, once it comes online as an AP course, and the current AP Computer Science course? And you know, is there a natural flow through between them? Are they alternatives to each other? How, how do you see that, that, that current framework, Owen? Uh, that's also a question that comes up often, and I, so I think that, that, that the general idea is that if there is a sequence, and there doesn't have to be a sequence, so these courses are not designed for one to lead to the other, but I think this course, CS Principles course, is designed and capable of being taken by students earlier in their high school career than the APCSA course. Many schools require a prerequisite for APCSA. Not all, but many do. And this could be such a prerequisite because it does have a programming component to it as one of the seven big ideas. So part of the idea is that CS principles will lead to a larger number of students continuing to take computer science, whether that's APCSA in high school or going to college and then taking another introduction to computer science course at college. So I think it's natural to think of this course as enlarging the pipeline in the group of people that could continue into the, a later course. Not every school is going to be able to support their students taking two or three computer science courses. We hope, and you know, if I could envision a world that would be more conducive to this, we'd have computer science required in a lot of high schools rather than just kind of satisfying math and science. It would be yeah, we want you to take computer science. And maybe that's not far away, but it's not in the next few years. So I think computer science principles is a natural part of not necessarily a progression, but a buffet of options to students. So you can take one and then the other, or some students might know I want to do all programming all the time, in which case maybe computer science A is the right way for you to begin this process. But we know from historical experience that that group has not been representative of all genders and all underrepresented groups. So one, one way of thinking about this, and I've just been introduced to this idea of there are many paths rather than a pathway, because a pathway is like you're kind of stuck on it and you have to go from one to the other. But this is part of this kind of paths. So you might take computer science principles, you might take exploring computer science, you might take computer science A, and we hope that you will take computer science. And I think that's another key piece of this is that we're not thinking of this as, well, there's only going to be one survivor. All these options should be available to students because they're, they satisfy different needs in different audiences. I hope that many students that take computer science principles will go on to computer science A. And in a few schools, we know that the students that took computer science A really liked it and then wanted to do more. And so they do computer science principles because they can fit it into their schedule and it's not all programming so it kind of fits into a broader education in some ways and so we're seeing that too although not as many I had the uh, the pleasure yesterday uh, of meeting with uh, Senator Betty McCollum from um, from Minnesota and one of the things we were chatting about was how the view of STEM education has changed in the last few years and become suddenly much more uh, cognizant of the important role of computer science in, in student learning across the board. And I find it particularly interesting that, you know, work on this course has been happening for a very, very long time. And, and we've seen these kinds of shifts in how computer science has, is perceived and in the importance of making connections between computer science learning and other disciplines. Uh, mostly we think of the sciences, but this also includes the humanities. Um, when you think about how this course has been designed, it seems to me that, that with the seven big ideas, we've really looked at this issue of, you know, not just heads down programming computer science, but 
what is this discipline and how does it connect to the world? Would you agree that that's been a, a part of the, the, the plan for the development? And how is that manifested in the actual course? I think, yes, absolutely, that's been part of the plan. And just to make it clear to everybody listening in, Chris, you were one of the main champions of that right from the beginning, making sure that the academic computer science people didn't lose sight of both the interdisciplinarity of what we were doing and the societal aspect of it. So, you know, make, making sure that you get that acknowledgement here for helping make sure that happens. So that was and has been designed from the beginning. And I think we're seeing that. Uh, I know we're especially seeing that in the colleges that I know about that are doing computer science principles courses, where we're getting students from a wide variety of majors coming to this course um, some of them kind of too late because they take it as a senior or a junior and then saying, man, I wish I'd taken this as a first year student because I might have taken more and I might be able to kind of not do a major but have some more courses that might help me in the areas that I'm interested in, whether that's sociology or English or cultural anthropology. So I know we're seeing that at the college level, not just where I teach but where many of the, my colleagues are teaching as well. And I think that's going to filter down so that in high schools, students aren't going to be labeled as, well, that's one of the computer science kind of nerd boys, and I think that's the key thing there, that we're going to see people that are taking AP European History and Studio Art taking this course and hopefully not get that label, and I, and I think that's going to be key, and, and it was absolutely part of the design process, and I really appreciate it that that has how it has evolved. One of the things that, that I think that you've hit upon that's such, a, such an important thing is the misconceptions about computer science and who is doing it and who should do it and what they care about and what they love. And I, I recently was in Paris and, and had a chance to, to go to our Google Paris office and there's a, there's a Google project called the Google Cultural Institute. Blew my mind um, just in terms of the, the work they're doing at making culture accessible to the world. And, and, and about, you know, what was so exciting about that is this is about art. It's about, you know, formal art in museums and it's about street art and it's about, you know, making it widely accessible to everyone. And, and, I, and I really see a changed perspective about both how we're viewing computer science as a community of educators and, and hopefully how it's being viewed externally. But sometimes I worry that, well, a lot of time these days, I worry about parents. I worry that they're, you know, we know that they are major influencers in what their kids are doing and the choices they make for their, for the courses they take and the, and the pathways they follow. Um, if you, if you had a chance to more broadly address the parent community, what would you say to them about, about this course and about providing guidance? Uh. That, I think that would be a, a, a complex answer that I'll try to distill into just a few sentences. One, many parents are interested in knowing that their kids have options in terms of jobs after they leave college. And so that's an easy one. So I won't, I won't dwell on it, but there's so many job opportunities available, not just in computer science, and that's, I think, the key thing that I would emphasize to parents. Not everybody wants to be or is going to be a software engineer, but there's so many jobs where expertise and knowledge of computing and computer science can help and can be a, a, a way of getting into that job that you might not anticipate. So taking computer science doesn't mean you're going to be a software engineer, although there are plenty of opportunities for software engineers. But instead it might be a way of doing kind of this interdisciplinary way of understanding computer science. And so that some teachers, sorry, some parents want to know yes, this is going to help my child with a job. And some parents want to know, this is part of being an effective global citizen, that you need this knowledge to kind of be, not, not to survive, but to play an integral role in society that we live in today. So I think I would emphasize both aspects of computer science principles, that it's a way of getting to know about what this discipline can do for you, both as a vocation and an avocation, and it will help you be an effective citizen in, in, in ways of navigating the world we live in, which is not a cyber world, but the world we live in does have a large cyber component, and understanding how that works, I think, is an important part of, of who we are and where we live. So before we kind of move to wrapping up, I just want to make sure you have a chance to, 
to get in there about anything that I should have asked you or that you know you really want the audience to know about about this course, uh, the, the timing, or anything else that you would like to share with our virtual and live audience. I think the, I think this has been great. Um, the the folks that are part of Computer Science Principles try to respond to all email requests. So you know when if questions arise and people see this either later or now, we, we do try to answer those questions. And if some something doesn't happen, pop a note again. Um, and I think just emphasizing, Chris, what you've been saying from the beginning, the large support we've gotten both from Google and other corporate sponsors, from 5013C's nonprofits, from the academic, I think this whole, the whole group of people that are working in this area has been so exciting to be part of. Um, and I, I hope that everybody watching this will want to be part of that too, because we do need support to continue the, the growth of it. So support would be great. And I appreciate all the support that you all are giving from Google as well. So, so for our teachers out there, um, those who may not have had much experience yet with the course, where do they go for information? What do they need to learn and where should they start? Uh, APCSprinciples.org or CSprinciples.org. We try I'm, the the first one I mentioned, APCSprinciples.org, will be the final resting site. It's still under development as a replacement for CSprinciples.org, but we're trying to keep pointers to all the different options and projects, to all the curriculum guidelines that are there. Um, so Google is your friend. It, as the search engine, it's reasonably powerful. Uh, computer science principles will get you a lot of places, and so starting from one place and going from there is, is a great way to go. I, I hope teachers will consider getting to either the CSTA conference and or the SIGSI conference. There will be many resources and people to meet at those places. And I think we'll try to make sure that we can meet everybody. So I'm trying my best to make sure I meet some new people instead of talking to my friends at these places. Uh, and there are many, many of us will be at, at both those places. So teachers, please come. And keep your eyes open for announcements from both Google and other venues for more resources that will be available for teachers and, and support for teachers to be part of those so that they, they can attend on a, without having to reach deeply into their own pockets. But my last question for you, Owen, is this, this project, this course, has been a labor of love for you for a very long time. Um, and, and I think it must be very gratifying to see it moving towards fruition as such a well-conceived course for engaging all students. As I mentioned earlier, you know, Jan Cuny set this goal for us of 10,000 teachers teaching this course in 10,000 schools. If your wildest dreams were to come true, your wishes for this course, five years from now, what, what would you like to see in terms of this course in our schools? I would like to see this course have been picked up by a lot of schools and be part of this palette of courses because this course is going to be one of several ways that teachers and students can engage and I'd like it to be thought of as part of a partnership that was changing the landscape for computer science to make it accessible to everyone. So I'm confident that it will succeed. I want it to succeed because of the other initiatives that it's part of, both APCSA, CS for HS, Exploring Computer Science. I, I, would, I would hope that rather than pointing at just one thing, we pointed at the community for having kind of taken hold of this and saying, look, we have a lot of great options. Computer Science Principles is one of them. And that whole community has kind of re-energized and engaged without yelling at each other. Uh, that would make me very happy that Computer Science Principles was part of making us talk civilly and working towards a common goal. That would be great. Well, on behalf of, of Google and the CS for HS program, I'd really like to thank you, Owen, um, for two things, both for talking with us today, taking time from your schedule to do that, and, and sharing your wealth of information with, with our audience, but also for the work that you've done, the, the vision that you've brought to this project, and you know the incredible work of all of your committee to to get this from a you know a grand idea to to a real course. Um, I'd like to thank all and recognize all the folks who've been with us virtually and to let you know you can share this with your friends because it's been recorded and we know that teachers 
are often very busy during the day and come back to us uh, when they have some time to do so. And so we will be making this available. And I'd like to thank um, the lovely Pooja for being our uh, producer here today. Owen, thank you so much. Very much appreciated. Keep, keep doing all the great work. And Google will continue to support you because we believe this is really important. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Pooja. And thanks, Virtual World. It's been great to be here. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all in real life or virtually sometime soon. Thanks, Owen. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.